Okay, so we've had lots of discussions about bonds. Um, uh, we're just going to be more clear, and then we're going to talk about some other stuff that we haven't talked about before about other ways to think about bonding. So there's lots of ways to think about it, and each time we discuss this bonding stuff, we think about it, or we're going to talk about it in a more complicated manner, which better entails what's actually going on. So let's talk about how we've talked about it before. So um, why, do those, why do elements um, form compounds? So we talked about this in, in 121. So what were the reasons that uh, um, one atom reacted with another atom to form a compound? Because they wanted to give up um, electrons. Okay. They, they, want, electrons. Gain. they wanted to give up or gain electrons. Great. So they're, they're simply trying to gain or lose electrons so they can have a filled energy level and then they can look like noble gases. Okay. So by doing that, what they're what they're really trying to do is get rid of their energy. Are you okay with me saying that? Yeah, because yeah. electrons are energy. Mm, no, not that electrons are energy, but that uh, like if you've got a, a, a piece of wood, they're going to throw in the fire. There's energy mm. stored in that in chemical bonds, right? Potential energy. Then you. Yeah. Shell is is a uh, it doesn't have any energy to give. Yeah, once you've gotten to that full shell, you're an inert gas and you don't do anything. So that's what nature is trying to do. It's trying to make everything not do be into a, a, a state where they're finished doing stuff. So I thought it was supposed to be like every or I thought nature's ideal thing was that it, everything was doing something. Like, no, no. Yeah. Physics, physics wants everybody to stop doing stuff. That's pretty much the, <laughs> what's going on, and uh, and nature is fighting that um, by adding energy to stuff. So, if you've got like a like a nail or a screw or something, and it's made out of iron, and it it'll react with the oxygen. So you know the iron is reactive and you know the oxygen is reactive, but what happens when they come together and form rust? Iron oxide? They don't react anymore? They don't react anymore. They're finished reacting. You can't get rust to burn because it's already done the thing that burning does. You can't get... You sound like you're talking through, I don't know, a pillow. <laughs> Sorry, humble. <laughs> Unless you add like aluminum powder to the iron and make thermite. Uh, no, we already said that we don't have iron. We've, we've got rust. I meant iron oxide and aluminum. Well, you're, you're changing something now because now you're adding an element that is very reactive to that. That's caught, that's, that wants to be, uh, that wants to rust more than the iron does. That's pretty much how that works. We'll, we'll get to that when we get to uh, um, electrochemistry. So things, atoms are looking to fill those energy levels either by gaining electrons or losing electrons. And then when they do, they, they kind of stop reacting. So when we're talking about Lewis structures and valence shells, um, the the easiest way to think about it is octets, except for the smaller elements that will do a duet. Because if you're uh, if you're lithium, you're looking to give away one electron, and if you give that one electron away, you don't have eight electrons, so you don't have an octet. You've only got three electrons to start with. So what you're trying to do, instead of looking like neon or one of the other noble gases, you're trying to look like helium. So that. Octet for most stuff, but but not for the really small stuff. The easiest example to talk about is sodium and chlorine. So the sodium reacts with the chlorine. The sodium didn't want the electron. The chlorine wants the electron. And so the sodium gives the electron to the chlorine. The chlorine actually has possession of that electron now. So the sodium doesn't have possession on it. And so now we're not talking about a sodium atom or a chlorine atom. What are we talking about? Ions. Yeah, we're talking about ions, and, and that's good since we're sitting here talking about ionic bonds. <laughs> so the Lewis structure initially, sorry, the um, these are the Lewis structures, but the um, 
uh, electron configurations initially were sodium ending in this 3s1 and chlorine ending in this 3 3 um, p5 and what we really want to do is get this sodium to lose that one electron and get this chlorine to fill that last one in and so we end up here and so now the electron configuration that we have for for this sodium ion matches what um, helium, or helium. helium. Oh, Wait. helium only neon? has two electrons. Yeah, mm -hmm. it matches neon. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so <laughs> is it done reacting? Yes. yes. It looks like a noble gas, right? Noble gases don't react, so it's done reacting. And then what about this this chlorine? Is it done reacting? I mean, it's also done reacting because this looks like what? A noble gas or it xenon argon argon. Mm -hmm. The cable. Where is it? Could you same? Could you get them to react again? Yes. How so? With a Take lot of energy. energy. A good amount of energy, and this is how we found a lot of elements. So let's say you're the first person to realize first first person to find chlorine. Okay. So you did that by taking table salt and running electricity through it. And what happened? The sodium became metal and the chlorine went to a gas, right? And what happened to you? Dead. <laughs> no, you went blind in one eye. You had burns on one side of your face. You have half lung capacity and you stopped doing stuff like that, but still found more elements. <laughs> But that, that's that's what you would have done, and and that is what happened. Um, that that's the sort of stuff that chemists playing with things and they don't know what's going on, right? In the same way, if a kid's playing with stuff, they don't realize what's going to happen. I mean, during this time period, we were children, messing with stuff, not realizing how dangerous that stuff was. I mean, could you imagine me having you run electricity through sodium chloride in the lab? If we had the money for it. Where's my gas mask? No, no, you can't. It doesn't matter what money we're talking about. I mean, this is literally a wire and table salt. There's no cash involved. The issue is you'd have to be doing it inside of a uh, inside of a um, fume hood. In a fume hood. Can you do it safely without damaging yourself? Sure, but what are the ramifications of not doing it correctly? Death or maybe death? death? Well, death. Other people? Death how? Um, your biochemistry. How about the age increases in your blood or decreases and you die? All right. So the inhalation of the chlorine, it's killing air sacs, or somehow the sodium touches water and explodes, right? There's a <laughs> couple of bad things that could be happening to you. Okay. Um, and when we're finished with this, you end up having a sodium that's got a plus one charge and a chlorine that's got a minus one charge, and, and at least in chemistry, opposites attract, so they literally just stick to each other in the way that a north magnet and a south magnet stick to each other. Okay, so let's talk about covalent bonds. So it's, um, uh, let's back up one sec. Uh, when we're, just, just so we remember this from last class, what what type of, what do you need to have for an ionic bond to form? Uh, two, or a metal and a non-metal. No, you were gonna um, say it right the first time, um, Annika. A metal and a non-metal, yeah. No, you weren't gonna say that. Oh, right. is it two non-metals? No. Uh, so nobody was gonna say it. Anybody else wanna answer something else? Metal and non-metal. Cation and anion. Cation and an anion is the answer. Okay. A metal and a non-metal um, conforms to that, but we had exceptions to this. I'm just like, let me control A, control, control A. What's going on? Control A. Oh, there it is. Wait, where's all that from? Maybe I should use a pen that's got a finer point. 
Are there any metals or non-metals there? Sorry, no. are there any metals there? There, no. are, there are not. What kind of bond is this? I don't know. How do you know that? Because it has ammonia. Because that's ammonium, and that's a polyatomic ion. So it's got to be an, atomic, uh, an ionic bond. So your answer, metal and non-metal, isn't good enough. All metal and non-metals are ionic, but there are examples where it's not necessarily ionic. So um, we want to say uh, cation anion. So what about the covalent bonds? Two non-metals. Um, yeah, two non-metals. Okay. So the easiest examples to talk about these are um, some of the diatomics. So let's start with those. So does this little picture of the fluorine make sense? Yes. Yeah, two fluorines bonded together. So those two fluorines bonded together because each one of them has a Lewis structure with seven electrons. And what they're trying to see is eight. So that way they look like neon. But um, which one of those two fluorines has the ability to pull the electron away from the other fluorine? Neither. Yeah, they both have the same electronegativity, so they can't pull any harder. So instead of pulling harder, they, they just agree that we're going to share this. So you end up having this fluorine see eight electrons. And this fluorine, see these eight electrons. And it doesn't matter that the middle two electrons are seen by both of them. Is this a super strong bond? Yes. Anybody else? Can you give me a reason why you think it's a super strong bond? Because they're sharing the electrons. Or... Yeah, that's not a good answer. Is it because it's fluorine? No, that's not a good answer. It's not a good answer because it's not a strong bond. And how do you know that? Okay. Nope. Because if something else comes along that it wants to take an electron from, it, it wants to do that. that. It wants to do that more, right? So you know that this is not a strong bond because if it was a strong bond, when it ran into something, it wouldn't do anything because it's already bonded strongly to what it's bonded to. This, on the other hand, when it runs into something, it'll kill it. So it must not be bonded very strongly to itself. We okay with that? Okay. So this is a fluorine-fluorine single bond. So if you were to draw this, you would draw it like this. So what does that line between the two Fs constitute? Their bond together or the way the bond looks? Like the, um, the structure of their bond? those two electrons yeah it's a covalent bond is the sharing of two electrons a pair of electrons and so that line is indicating those two electrons and you don't have to draw the the dots around the exterior of the other ones that's not important unless somebody's asking you specifically for a lewis structure so this would be the overall lewis structure with the dots around it but if i somebody was going to say what's the fluorine fluorine bond look like i would just draw that is that good? If a covalent bond shares multiple sets of electrons, it's just represented by more lines, right? Let's do that. Cool. Okay, so here we've got oxygen. And so the oxygens have six for their Lewis structure. And so that means if they share two electrons, that's not going to be good enough. That's only going to get them to seven. So each oxygen is going to share two electrons. So this oxygen is going to see all of those electrons, and then this oxygen is going to see all of those electrons. We okay with that? Mm -hmm. Is this a strong bond? No. I would, I would say not really strong. Tell me about its strength compared to fluorine. It's stronger. stronger. It's significantly stronger than fluorine because it won't just kill you out, right? If you were exposed to about 20% fluorine gas in the atmosphere, you'd be dead. But you're exposed to 20% oxygen right now, and you're not dead. But do you remember our discussion about that kid that got attacked by the bear? Yeah. <laughs> what is this? Um, what was this? I heard, I heard somebody say yes. Who was that? I did. I remember it. 
So, yeah, we I talked about the fact that he gets attacked by the bear. He's left. Um, his uh, uncle and father don't find him for like two or three days. And so he's just laying there in the mud after a bear has bitten him and, oh, and clawed oh him. God. And yeah, so, he's and so he, he gets get infected. Yeah, he yeah. got infected. He got gangrene. And so they yeah. took him to the hospital and his, his uh, wound on his leg was so severe. What did the doctors want to do? Just cut it off. They wanted to cut it off. And he's like, listen, I'm 14 years old and I'm a farm boy and a hunter. You can't chop my leg off without trying something else. And what did they try? Pure oxygen. Pure oxygen. Yeah, hyperbaric chamber, right? So they shove mm -hmm. him in a hyperbolic chamber, mm -hmm. jack the oxygen content up to 100%. And the gangrene starts dying. But then what else starts to happen? The boy He's dying. dying. He's dying. So once the concentration is, you know, above what we're normally used to, which is that um, 20%, you, you're, so let's back off one sec. That oxygen-oxygen bond is still pretty darn reactive. How do we know that? Makes things burn. Yeah. It oxidizes things. I was just going to write. Fire. Right? Fire happens because of oxygen. If oxygen had a super strong bond, fire wouldn't exist. Not from oxygen, at least. You'd have to have some other oxidizing agent. So, and it also tears apart glucose molecules inside your cells, right? Yeah. And we want that to happen. That's great. So, um, we do know that this is pretty reactive, and once we were in that, if you stick somebody in a hyperbolic chamber, it becomes so reactive that the cells inside your lungs start to decompose, and the oxygen pumped into your bloodstream is massive compared to what it's normally supposed to be, five times more, and so the cells inside your body start to die because the oxygen doesn't have anything else to do because, I mean, he's just laying there in a hyperbolic chamber, right? I mean, maybe if he was active or something like that, he could withstand it for a longer period of time because he'd be using it, but... You got oxygen floating around in your bloodstream, not doing anything. So what does it do? It starts grabbing. Them. It starts oh. doing stuff it's not supposed to do. Like if you had a whole bunch of high school age boys standing around someplace they weren't supposed to be, and they were bored out of their minds, they'd start to do stuff they weren't supposed to do. Right. <laughs> right. Would it, would yeah. Would it do anything to the pH of your blood? Because we've talked about that a couple of times. Sure. You'd end up. Um, <clears throat> You'd end up having really acidic blood from all the acids that were formed from the oxidation of different substances, mostly cell membranes. Okay. 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 So we know the oxygen is reactive, but we know it's not as reactive as the fluorine. How would you draw this? Uh, would it just be like O with two lines in between it and then another O? It would just be an O with two lines and another O. And if you wanted to, you could throw the dots down. And sometimes people do that, and they do it more often than the fluorine because the oxygen is more reactive um, with the other electrons than the fluorine is, but uh, not important. If it's just asking you for an oxygen-oxygen bond, you can just throw the double lines up there. So what's this constitute? A stronger bond. And four electrons. You okay with that? So, so one line is equal to two electrons? Yeah, each one of these lines, whoa. <laughs> Forgot I did that. Each one of these lines is two electrons. Every time you see a line between two atoms in a covalent bond, it means two electrons are being shared. That's like a shell. So tell me what happens uh, well, actually, let's just move on to the next one. Let's do nitrogen next. So, control A, control E. All right, so what's going on with the nitrogen? Uh, triple bond. Lines. So, I've got three lines here, right? And so, these three lines constitute the fact that they're sharing three <laughs> electrons each. So, they're still seeing eight, but we end up with a nitrogen tri 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 done. How about this bond? Is this bond strong? It's stronger, yeah. than, it's stronger than oxygen. It's about as, as th this nitrogen diatomic is about as unreactive as a noble gas. Not quite, but pretty darn close. Mm -hmm. And how do you know that? It's like the so, majority of our atmosphere and it doesn't kill us. 80% of our atmosphere is nitrogen and it's not really doing anything. It's more like just taking up some space. 
but it doesn't do anything on our body. It doesn't do any oxidation. It doesn't, uh, um, it doesn't react with the glucose to give us respiration. It, it, um, it doesn't do anything. So does that make it a strong bond? It does. It makes it actually a very strong bond. So this triple bond for nitrogen is a very strong bond. And what's the other way that we know that this triple bond is a strong bond? Um, Let me ask a different question. Is it a problem that this triple bond is a strong bond? Not so much a problem as something to be overcome. I guess if you want to make like nitrogen based organic molecules. Okay, I, that's a great answer. So, the so plants need nitrogen, right? Mm -hmm. So, what kind of nitrogen do plants like? Uh, nitrates. Yep. I'm trying to draw a heart here, but I'm not doing a very good job. <laughs> it's heart nitrogen, but they don't like this version of it. They like this, and they like this. They love those things. So how do we do that? Well, I have to make some modifications and I think we'll talk about how, we did a little bit of discussion about this, but we'll talk more about this later on. But uh, as far as what humans do, but how does, I mean, plants have been on this planet long before humans were here. So how did nature get this stuff here to turn into this stuff over here? Uh, by animals dying and becoming like compost? No. Uh, before mm, animals. Does bacteria break those down into um... So there's there's two <laughs> methods. One, bacteria. So have you guys um well Sheen, what do you know what the name of that is? Nitrogen cycle. Uh, the bacteria uh, themselves. Oh um oh shoot, I used to because like they, they're you can buy them in bulk from like organic <laughs> fertilizer houses for like uh organic yeah. um, what's the word here nitrate nitrogen blank bacteria nitrogen x no nitrogen fixation thank you nitrogen fixing bacteria so it's probably not a good word fixing I mean, it's not like it's broken or anything, but really what we're saying is there's a bacteria that can bust this bond. And when it breaks that bond, it makes nitrates. So plants will join in a symbiotic relationship with these not nitrogen fixing bacteria. And so what you might see on, on some plant roots are these little bubbles or nodules. And what's inside the nodules? The bacteria. bacteria. The bacteria live there. Water can get in there and air can get in there. So nitrogen fixing bacteria nodules, if you were looking for them on the root system, where in the root system would you find this? Aren't they usually like near the surface? Yeah, they have to be near the surface mm -hmm. root, right? Because if they're not, then they don't have access to the atmosphere. So um, if you like brush the dirt off or uh, of some plants, you actually see these little bubbles, things like uh, mustard seed, really good at it. Um, so that's one reason why like mustard seed and rapeseed oil seed will, or rapeseed uh, will be used as crop rotation because they're really good at fixing nitrogen back into the soil. Okay, so is there any other way nature can get nitrogen into the soil in a usable way for plants? Can't some mm -hmm. fungus do that as well? Yeah, fungus. Okay, sure. I could change that from nitrogen fixing bacteria to nitrogen, nitrogen fixing, fixing microbes. <laughs> um, Spores. Anything else? Tell me where there are a lot of trees. In forests. And, uh, <laughs> and where are the forests? Um, high Near um, rivers. Um, and what happens around those forests? Animals? Do animals die? Yes. Yeah. Well, oh, please. fires, duh. 
rain and lightning. Oh. So what's lightning do? Lightning lights fires. Um, Anything else? Is it like yeah, does something to the air? It splits atoms, or atoms. It splits. Um, so as the lightning bolt travels through the atmosphere, which is eighty percent nitrogen, what and it's bouncing from nitrogen to nitrogen. What happens to the nitrogen when it gets hit? Breaks, it breaks apart. That apart. triple bond is no match for a one point two one gig gigawatt. So when it busts apart, now I've got this nitrogen free floating in the atmosphere. Is that nitrogen happy about that? No. 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 So what happens if it ran into some poor O2 molecule? It would bond with it. It'll bond with it. And now I've got NO2, which will eventually turn itself into NO3. How? Various reactions with another O2 or some other stuff that's happening. Because if this lightning bolt is breaking this N2, what do you think it's doing to this bond? Breaking it as well. Yeah, so this guy gets thrown apart. So now I've got oxygens flying through the atmosphere. And what happens if they run into another oxygen? They will bond. They'll bond. Mm -hmm. and they'll, oxide, right? No, they'll turn into ozone. Or, uh, ozone, yeah, that's right. And so this is super reactive. So when the ozone runs into, I don't know, a nitrogen, molecule or a free nitrogen you get things new things made so when lightning happens i know people get freaked out by it and think it's a bad thing but it's usually a good thing because it's separating out molecules so these guys these two ends are stuck together and not reactive and lightning comes in and breaks them apart and makes them chemically reactive and usable by plants again so anywhere where you've got lots and lots of lightning You've got lots and lots of fertile soil. So can somebody tell me where on this earth we've got lots and lots of lightning? Uh, it's somewhere in Colombia. No. Oregon? No. Texas? No. Alaska? Uh, okay, so I said uh, wait, lots and lots uh, of fertile soil, uh, right? Wyoming? Like the middle area of the United States? All, all of this stuff here in the middle, right? The Midwest. What is this called? The Rust Belt? No, that's the not the Rust, Rust Belt. I think it's <laughs> something else. It's fine. They got more north. Uh, how do I make that smaller? Oh, I know what happened. That's bad. <laughs> Let me try that again. Let me use this. Tornado Alley? No, I don't. I mean, Tornado yeah. Alley isn't the complete middle of the United States. I mean, it goes into it, but it's flatland. I'm just trying to think of a very specific term for yeah. it. I'm sure I've heard a thousand times, just not thinking of it. I don't think anyone really cares about it that much. They always forget about it. Oh, don't say that. It's not like the bread, uh, bread something. Yes, bread. it is the bread something. The bread bowl? The bread. bread basket. The bread oh, the bread basket. basket. Right. Oh, I, it really came up to me when I was like, wait, Russia has a similar wordage for uh, Ukraine. This. What else happens here? Lightning and tornadoes and natural disasters. So tons of nitrogen molecules get separated and turned into nitrates and whatnot and fertilize the soil. So we grow an awful lot of food there because that soil is very, very rich because of what's going on with the atmosphere. And, and somebody else said something about the Rust Belt. Yeah. yeah that, I did. that would be here. Okay, thank you. All of these factories that went dormant. Like Detroit. Detroit, Chicago, all, almost all of Ohio, all of those car manufacturers and whatnot that were building supply stuff and in Ohio and Western Pennsylvania. Yeah, that's the Rust Belt. Oh, actually, all of Pennsylvania because on the far east of Pennsylvania, Bethlehem and Allentown, where there's steel produced, but it's not there anymore and all those factories yeah. are rusting. Okay. Okay. Uh, Billy Joel made this up. <laughs> he, he did make a song called Allentown, even though it's kind of silly since most of the factories are in Bethlehem. He just couldn't get anything to rhyme with Bethlehem. 
<laughs> I've heard that before, yeah. Bethlehem rice and spam. Oh my god. Stop. Wait, what? <laughs> Alright, so we talked about three diatomics. Those are just elements. So let's talk about uh, a molecule that's not a diatomic. So how about this one here? So can we <clears throat> see control D? Oh. Urban dioxide. So what's happening with this CO2? Yeah, the oxygen made double bonds with the carbons. So there so, are two lines in between each letter. Yeah, so we're seeing eight for the oxygens, right? And then we're seeing eight for the carbons. Oh. And so I've got an oxygen doubly bonded to a carbon, doubly bonded to an oxygen. And there's my CO2. And this is um, this is what you get after you react oxygen and after you react carbon molecules, right? Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't have any energy left in it. It doesn't have anything to do. And so this is basically, what, what did we call this before? A spent battery. A spent battery. <laughs> the electrons that ox that the carbon has available to be used are used, and so this is the carbon. It, one of the versions of carbon that would be considered inorganic carbon. And when we get to one twenty three, we'll be super specific about that. Yeah, what's the difference between organic and inorganic? Mostly just the ability to do something. Okay. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about are polar molecules. So what do we, just a second here, I just want to look at, okay. All right, so what I want to make clear with this discussion about polar, um, basically the entire rest of this set of notes is about you being able to identify if a molecule is going to be polar or not. It's going to take, it's good, for some of the molecules, it's going to be difficult for you to determine it. So we have 13, sorry, we have 10 more pages of notes basically to discuss how we determine if the molecule is polar or not. Okay. How okay. do we define polar? Um, we'll get that in one second. So what I want to make sure that you understand is your goal for these next 10 pages is for me to be able to put a molecule in front of you and for you to be able to tell me will that mix with water or not that mm -hmm. is your goal okay mm -hmm. so you know lots of things that do mix with water and lots of things that don't mix with water right mm -hmm. and what's the yeah. reasoning behind the mixing and not mixing because the uh thing that's being mixed is soluble or not in water yeah what's the reason so mixing means soluble the electrical charges they have or if they're neutral or uh, polar if they have a positive end and a if it's polar it mixes with water if it is not polar it cannot mix with water okay mm -hmm. all right so what does that word polar mean to you just like not in a chemistry uh, opposite like opposites pole. okay north pole south pole north magnet south magnet something like that so what we're gonna do what <clears throat> the only bear that shouldn't go in the water or the only bear that mixes with water yeah. <laughs> all right so when we're talking about this with chemistry we're going to be talking about the fact that a molecule will have polarity meaning one side of the molecule will be positive and one side of the molecule will be negative, but not a full-fledged plus one or, or minus one charge. It's going to be a partial positive or a partial negative charge. And so like half? Not, not even a half. So do you know this symbol here? Delta. This, no. is, this is delta. This is the lowercase Greek letter oh. delta. So the uppercase is a triangle and the lowercase, I don't know, I don't know what it is, whatever. Kind of looks like a, a G upside down, maybe. A wavy B. Sure. So in chemistry, physics, and in math, that little symbol means partial. So if you're talking about a partial differential, then you would see that symbol being used. So here we're going to be talking about partial charges. 
So not, it's not like uh, at the beginning of the set of notes where we had the sodium give an electron to the chlorine and become plus one. It's not gonna be a plus one. So this, this can't happen with molecules that are uh, ionic. So polar molecules can only happen in molecules that are covalent, okay? Mm -hmm. So right off the bat, if I put a molecule in front of you and you're like, this is ionic, so um, this is not a polarity question. Okay, so the best molecule to talk about with this, the easiest one is um, hydrofluoric acid. So what we need to talk about with polarity is why would a molecule be polar? And so the reasoning is that one side of the molecule is negative and one side is positive. So where does that negativity come from? In, in, mm -hmm. in an atom or molecule, where do you get negativeness? Uh, electrons. 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 So on the negative side of the molecule, what can you say about the electrons? There is a greater density. Mm -hmm. Yeah, greater it's density is great. Closer, right? They're hanging out on that side of the molecule more often. So that makes that side of the molecule look kind of negative, which also makes the other side of the molecule look kind of positive. Okay, so things that are polar have that going for them. So in hydrofluoric acid, it's a pretty big deal because you've got fluorine that's got an electronegativity number of about four and hydrogen's number is about 2.1. So the difference in electronegativity is pretty severe. So when I put this Lewis structure up, I see this. And so I've got a hydrogen and a fluorine sharing a pair of electrons. So how would you draw that? Just two lines in between them? Yeah, you just, you just draw an H line and an F. And so you're like, okay, so they're sharing these two electrons. Great. But since this guy's electronegativity is 4.0 and this guy's electronegativity is 2.1, and what's the electronegativity number represent? Uh, it's, not electron affinity, is it? it's not quite the same thing, but basically amounts to the same thing. Electronegativity is um, taking electrons. So on the table, fluorine's got the largest electronegativity. So fluorine can take electrons from any atom on the table except self. And noble gases. And noble, noble gases. gases. Oops. <laughs> Nobel. Habit. Okay, so what you end up having are these two electrons, this black electron here, is spending much more time around the fluorine than it is around the hydrogen. So you end up having a cloud distribution that looks like this picture in the middle where those electrons just happen to be spending more time around the F. So in that case, the fluorine gets to be the negative, partial negative, and the hydrogen gets to be the partial positive. So you've got an arrow that goes the direction that the electron is being polarized. And then you put a little hash on the left side of the arrow, and then in this case, and then that shows you that the left side is the positive side because the electron went to where the arrow is pointing to. Does that make sense? So fluorine is in the negative side and uh, the H is in the positive side? Yep, because the electrons are spending more time around the fluorine. And why are they spending more time around the fluorine? Mm -hmm. Because the fluorine's electronegativity is greater. That's it. So can you tell me right now two, two requirements to have a polar molecule? Higher electronegativity. So you need, between two atoms, you need to have a greater, one of them needs to have a significantly greater electronegativity in the other. And then what's the other requirement? It needs to be a covalent bond. It needs to be a covalent bond. So we're talking about a shared bond and one of the sides isn't sharing evenly. So if you're talking about uh, is there any polarity in this bond right here? No. This one? No. Or this one? No. No, because they're all pulling equally hard. We'll talk about this one later. Not right now. So oh, no. the, um, if the difference is less than 0.5, then you don't really have any polarity. The, that small 0.5 difference isn't enough to cause the electron to spend 
much more time around that side. And if it's greater than 1.9, then you're looking at something that's ionic and it's not going to be polar at all anyway. Okay. Is the is the fluorine side heavier? Doesn't have anything to do with mass. Okay. Okay, so um is it a big deal? Polar and nonpolar? <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Who's yelling about carbohydrates? That, that, that might be my brother. I'm sorry, I'll mute myself. Okay. <laughs> okay, so my question is Is polarity a, like a big deal? Yeah. It is. How? Can you give me a reason why it's a big deal? Well, the, like you say, like if it's polar, it can dissolve in water, and if, if something's nonpolar, it can't dissolve in water. It acts acts a certain way. Okay. Um, is there any like uh, fundamentally monumental thing that polarity is controlling that would be kind of important to you? Well, I mean, lipids. Lipids. All right, yeah, how about the fact that you're made of cells and cells are made of lipid bilayers, which have polar sides and nonpolar portions to them. So that interaction allows us to have cells that have membranes that have differentiation between, otherwise we'd be giant what? Blobs and water. Give me a, not, give me a better word than blob. <laughs> uh, oh. Amoeba. Sack. <laughs> would be giant amoebas right we can only have one cell so i mean amoebas can be pretty darn big but they they can't be like 215 pounds big that'd be scary it reminds me of a original star trek episode where a, an amoeba did get that big and it was like eating planets and stuff i think i remember that one yeah like it was pretty funny <laughs> um okay so Let's uh let's talk a little bit about the generalization and uh, of use of polarity just in everyday life. So when you're, can you give me an example of uh, something that's nonpolar? Metal. Nope, metal is is not a covalent substance. So you 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 missed out with that one. Is sugar? Say again. Sugar, but sugar mixes in water. Yeah. So not. Hmm. Not sugar. Olive oil. Olive oil. Ah, we get with that? Sugar. So you've got a pot of water on the stove and you're gonna start to boil it and you drop in a little bit of oil because when you when the the pasta goes into the water, you want it to hit that oil. That way it doesn't stick to itself. But you know that you put the oil, it's not like you put the oil in and then five minutes later you're like, Did I add any oil to that water? How do you know? Because there's a bunch of yellow circles. Because there's a bunch of yellow circles sitting on top. It's very, very obvious. So they do not stick to each other. Um, so let's say that you had a bottle or a, a bowl full of olive oil. Could you put something into the olive oil and have it mix with the olive oil? Yeah, yeah it doesn't. I it didn't have water, maybe. Or if it was, if it was also nonpolar. Okay. Other, so other give me an example of something that's also nonpolar that would mix with that olive oil. Methane. Rosemary oil. Okay, so <laughs> if you say any word and then say oil, you're good to go, right? Yeah. Those oils are going to mix with each other. All right, so when, um, when I was in first grade, the U.S. turned 200. And How long was that? Well, <laughs> when, when did we declare our independence? Well... <laughs> Somebody should, like all of you should be blurting that answer out. Let's just say composition two hundred. I'm, I'm just, I'm just letting, I'm letting you guys take your time. With you can just tell us. Seventeen seventy six. So two hundred yeah. years later is nineteen seventy six. So I'm in first grade, and we we made bumper stickers out of construction paper that had like patriotic BS on it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> And then, and then when I got home, I took my paste and my bumper sticker and put it on our van. You just glued it onto the van? Was my mom upset? Yes. yes. 
No, <laughs> she was in no way upset whatsoever. Why? Because America. Because no. glue. Didn't they just peel off? No, keep talking. Um, Tell me about the glue that I had as a first grader. It, was it like Elmer's? Oh, Elmer's. Like or was it like keep was talking? Have have like keep talking. Forever? Keep talking. I haven't heard yeah. the answer yet. He's old, so it'll be like, like really. No, it's just regular Elmer's glue. But tell me about like, it. Like who? Like made of hooves? Hooves? Yeah, none of that matters. It's just bad glue. No, it's not bad glue. Why do you think? Why are you calling it bad glue? Because it's old. No, no. What? This is... what does age have to do with the? <laughs> Say that again about the bonds. I said move on. <laughs> no. Would the bonds just not be as strong because glue and I mean glue and metal? What kind of glue are they not going to give first graders? Super glue. glue. Why? Or Why not super glue? Because you'll get your hands stuck together because you're first graders. Okay, so don't first graders put their hands in their Elmer's glue and paste? They'll yeah. put it on their mouth. Okay, great. And so why are, why is nobody upset with that? Because it's non-toxic. No. Okay, all of you, take, take uh, each of you take a huge breath and don't say anything for three seconds. What are we talking about? So tell me about the glue that first graders get. It's a polar. polar. Why? Because it's water soluble. Because when you cover your hands in Elmer's glue or paste, and the teacher's like, well, good job wasting all of your glue. Now go over to the sink and wash it off. So what would have happened if it would have been super glue? It would not have washed off. It would off not have washed off. Because tell me about super glue. Because it's non-polar. Non so was my mom upset about me putting the bumper sticker on the back of the van? No. no. Why? Because she could just wash it off. Because we live in Oregon, and the first time it rains, the thing fell off. Right? Because it's polar. Okay, so... Have you ever put a bumper sticker on something and wanted to remove it? Yes. And did you do that with water? <clears throat> well, bumper stickers don't easily come off with water. They won't. Why not? Because they're using a non-water soluble glue on the bumper sticker. So the adhesive is a non-polar adhesive. Does that make sense that you make a car sticker out of non-polar adhesive? I mean, unless you're living in Arizona, it's going to rain and it's going to wash off otherwise. So what would you use to get the sticker glue off after you've like scraped it and it, it didn't all come off? Acetone or whatever it's soluble with. Okay, so. Whatever it's polar with. Give me, give me, no, not whatever it's polar with. It's non-polar. Non-polar. Oh, yeah, because non-polar only works with water. No, um, no, no. Polar works with water. Non-polar doesn't work the water, and you you just said that this glue is non-polar. So what do you need to remove it? Something non-polar. And how do you? Did we already talk about stuff that's non-polar? Yes. The answer to that is yes. Yeah. What non-polar thing did we already talk about? Oil. oil. Okay. So could you use olive oil to get this bumper sticker off your car? Yes. Yes. Would it work very well? Probably not. Mm -hmm. Would it work? Yes. Yeah. It would just take a little bit longer. So what else could you use besides olive oil? Uh, a harder oil. like uh... Not necessarily a harder oil, but another substance that's non-polar. We okay with that? So haven't you guys ever taken, used any non-polar solvents? Acetone, hexane, heptane, methane. Okay, really? Um, You're going to use methane gas and spray it on a bumper sticker? Like, I mean, stop talking. <laughs> that doesn't make any alcohol. sense whatsoever. Yeah, usually rubbing alcohol. Um, no, rubbing alcohol is polar. My mom likes to use coconut oil for everything. That's totally fine. Well, wait. How about isn't rubbing alcohol partially nonpolar as well? It is, but so is, I mean, it's, 
it's not good enough. How about, I mean, olive oil would work better than rubbing alcohol. So what about, um, have you never, you guys never used anything like goof off or gooby gone or anything like that? Oh yeah, gooby gone. It's like, mm. orange. that's a mixture of many of the things that Sheen was saying. Mm. Why a mixture? Because it's more powerful that way? It works better that way? It works better that way, but it works better that way because the glue that you're messing with is going to work real. is going to be polarized or non, it was going to dissolve really well in one of those substances. So, so they just used all of them just in case. Correct. One of them works best. And so then that mixture is going to take care of almost anything. Um, do you guys know this, the compound that I've got down there at the bottom of this paragraph? This, CBD 40. Yeah. Are we familiar with that? Anybody unfamiliar with that? So everybody's used that Ever, blue and yellow can before? Yeah. Does it, does it make things stick or does it make things not stick? It's a lubricant. It's a it's, lubricant. It is, it is absolutely 100% not a lubricant. Okay, so it makes things stick. No, it is not an adhesive. It's a nonpolar solvent. It is not a lubricant because it's very um, not viscous, meaning it's very water-like. So if you were to take WD-40 and spray it on your bike chain, it one, it'll just drain off of it and then it'll evaporate. So now you don't have anything on your bike chain. But I do use WD-40 all year long on my bicycle chain. In what way? Wasn't it keep off the water? Nope, because it evaporates it and it's gone. Yeah. Does it help with the rest? No. I will put a grease on my chain. Oh. To get off grease. But eventually, what's going to happen to that grease is I'm riding my mountain bike around. Dirty. It's going to get dirty, and then it will stop working as grease. So then what do I use the WD-40 for? To so completely remove, remove the grease. grease. It, it dissolves the grease into the WD-40 and then it just comes off like, like water. Otherwise, I'm sitting there with, I could go down there with a towel and try to pull it off, but it doesn't work very well. So you spray it with WD-40, it solubilizes that, that grease and then it all just drains off. And then you can apply more grease after the WD-40 has evaporated off. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So WD-40 would work pretty well at taking off your bumper stickers, right? Say so yes, it's a nonpolar yeah. something or other, and grease is nonpolar. There are some really awesome nonpolar solvents that you wouldn't want to use. Does anybody know what's really dangerous to allow to touch car paint? Maybe dangerous is the wrong word, but uh, a substance that will remove car paint. Brake fluid? Brake fluid, exactly like dot three, dot four brake fluid, a drop of it hits your car. If you don't get it off there instantaneously, you're gonna see the metal. Like if you accidentally drop a drop of brake fluid on your, um, on the side of your car or something like that, you it'll take all of the paint off and you'll have um, bare metal there. So Hi. dot four brake fluid would be really good at taking off that bumper sticker, but it's also gonna take the paint off underneath the bumper sticker. But if you had a really sticky one and it was on like a window and you were super careful with it, you could get it off a window really easily. We good with that? Yeah. Okay. Gasoline is also a pretty good use. Pretty good at that. Getting polar, non-polar stuff off of things. Okay. So we want to move more on to uh, Lewis structures and um, this isn't just for atoms. We want to talk about this with molecules now. So there's five things we're going to talk about um, doing to determine these Lewis structures. And then we're going to do an example. And I think the examples are easier. So determine the total number of valence electrons in the molecular ion, um, including the if it's an ion, then you have to add or subtract electrons based on its charge. Um, put a skeleton down where nothing's really connected. Um, and with the most likely atom in the middle, connect everybody up with a single bond and then um, add dots so you can get to octets 
And then if you run out of dots, then you might need to do double bonds or single bonds. So let's talk about water. All right, so water molecule, two hydrogens and one oxygen. The hydrogen has one valence, the oxygen has six valence. So that gives us with eight total electrons. All right, so the skeletal structure, why am I gonna put the oxygen in the middle? Because the H bonds are full. No. no. It's the bigger matter, isn't it? No, it doesn't matter about mass. It's the thing that both hydrogens are bonding to, correct? True, but you don't know that before you put the, the structure down. It would That's create true. a different, it can, would create a different um, compound if can you, you bonded to each other. Yeah, but we're not concerning ourselves with that. Can you give me like a Sesame Street answer? <laughs> Which one of these is not like the other? The O. Put it in the middle. Because okay. if you're going to put one of the H's in the middle, which one are you going to pick? The one on the left. Why? I like it. Know, okay. You don't know which one. You it's know. identical to the one on the right. So when you say <laughs> one on the left, I don't even know that it's different than the one on the right because they're identical. So when you get into a situation where you've got an odd man out, put the odd man in the middle. <laughs> All right, so I've got this HOH structure, and then I connect them up with a single bond. How many electrons have I used connecting up single bonds between the O's and H? Four. Four total electrons per bond. Each one of those lines is two electrons. So I've used four of my eight electrons, leaving me with four electrons. So this structure right here, is anybody happy right here? No. Yes. Or, yeah, the hydrogens. Hydrogens only want to see two electrons, right? And there are two electrons for the hydrogens. So the oxygen's not happy, but we have four electrons left. So I'm going to put two electrons and two electrons, and now the oxygen sees two, four, six, eight, and the oxygen's happy. And we're good to go. We've used okay. all eight of our electrons, and everybody is um, satisfied with the number of electrons that they've got. So we're done with our Lewis structure. This might sound like a dumb question, but why does the O need eight electrons again? Octet, what's oxygen want to look like? Uh, like it wants to look like a noble gas. And with uh, and in this case, it's going to look like neon. So how many electrons is going to ne uh, need to look like neon? Two. How do we know that? Because the oxygen has six valence electrons. So it wants two more electrons, and then that way it's got 10 total electrons, and that's neon's electron configuration. Okay. And the hydrogen's trying to look like what? Um, helium. And helium has two electrons, and now the, it, the hydrogen looks like it's seeing two electrons. Is that good? Yeah. Okay. Let's do another one. So this is formaldehyde. The real name for it is uh, methanone. So I've got a carbon, two hydrogens, and an oxygen. And so uh, each of the hydrogens has what? Why doesn't the O go in between the two H's? In the, in, in the formaldehyde? Yeah. OK, so when we look on the periodic table, let's say we start at uh, lithium. Uh, column number one. So column number one, those guys are going to make one bond. Mm -hmm. And if I jump to the far side of the table and look at the fluorine column, those guys are going to make one bond. All right. Okay. When I move in one column on each side to the beryllium column and to the oxygen column, how many bonds are those columns going to make? Two. Two. Okay. If I move in another set of columns to the boron column and to the nitrogen column, how many bonds are those guys going to make? Three. Three. Nitrogen and then the carbon three. column make four. can make four. So if I shove the oxygen in the middle, but I need to connect three things to it, that doesn't work. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So I know I can't put hydrogen in the middle because it can only connect to one thing. And I can't put the oxygen in the middle this time because I got to connect three things to it. So, the want that, so you put the carbon in the middle. Because the carbon wants to connect four times. And so we're going to make the carbon connect four times. So my valence, 
the valence electrons are one for each of the hydrogen, six for the oxygen, and four for the carbon. So that ends up giving us 12 total electrons. I'm going to throw the carbon in the middle for the reasons that we just said. I'll have one bond up to everybody, and that's used two, four, six total of my 12 electrons. So I've got six electrons left. Um, my hydrogens are both happy. Tell me about, are my oxygens and or carbon happy? No, the oxygen isn't. What about the carbon? The it's carbon needs two more. Yeah, the oxygen needs to see six more and the carbon needs to see two more. And I have six electrons left. So I could put all six electrons around the oxygen and the oxygen's happy, okay. but what's wrong with that? Carbon isn't happy after that. Carbon still needs two. Or I could put two electrons on the carbon and make the carbon happy. So that doesn't work, right? Because then I took them away from the oxygen, so the oxygen's only seeing six. So this doesn't work. So when you get into this situation and moving a pair of electrons fixes one atom but not the other, then you take those two electrons and you turn them into a second bond. Okay. So are we okay with the carbon and the oxygen both seeing eight now? Yes. Yeah. Because the oxygen has two lone pairs, that's four, and then it's got two bonds, and that's four. And then the carbon has um, four total bonds. And so that gets us to eight, since each of the bonds is two electrons. So, um, and then that also satisfies the discussion that we had a second ago about how many bonds things can make. So the hydrogens make one, the oxygens make two bonds, and in the, this case, the carbon makes four bonds. And so we've satisfied all those requirements as well. Are we good with that? Mm -hmm. Remember while we're talking about this? Polarity. We're trying to determine if stuff is polar or not. We're not there yet, but we need to be able to look at a molecule, determine its Lewis structure, and then, then we're going to have to determine something else besides just its Lewis structure. Um, but this isn't a Lewis structure for formaldehyde. Okay, so we need to talk about a couple, um, four basically problems with the octet rule. So boron and aluminum, they're in the same column and phosphorus and sulfur, these guys, they don't, um, they don't always conform to the uh, octet rule. The aluminum and the boron are not gonna conform to the octet rule. They're only gonna wanna see six electrons, period. They don't wanna see eight. So don't try to shove eight electrons around the aluminum, that's just incorrect. The phosphorus and sulfur are fine with eight electrons, but they're also fine with 10 and 12 electrons. Does anybody want to talk about why? Is it the D orbital? Yeah, that is it. So in the, uh, so let's say like a sulfur is 1s2, 2s2, 2p, that's not a p, 2p6, <laughs> 3s2, 3p4, 3? Uh, I got to get it to 16, 4. There we go. 3P4. Okay, so I've got my first energy level is full. My second energy level is full. Tell me about my third energy level. It's almost full, but not quite. It's got, it needs to be, it, uh -uh. It would, if it were. It's not. The 3D is completely empty. I haven't put any electrons in the 3D. So the sulfur has how many spots, how many electron spots does the sulfur have to put stuff? How many electrons can you fit in the D sublevel? Uh, ten. 10 electrons. So the sulfur has 10 spots to shove extra electrons in. Are you okay with that? Mm -hmm. Same thing with the phosphorus. So if I go back over here, so I'm looking at this, this uh, phosphorus molecule, this phosphoric acid, and that phosphorus sees two, four, six, eight, ten electrons. So eight of them are where you would expect them to be, and then the other two electrons are tucked away in that 3D that has no electrons in it. And then the sulfur does the same thing, except it's tucking away four electrons. So the way you're going to use this is if you're trying to build a molecule and satisfy octets, and you've got a phosphorus or sulfur in the middle, and you, you're like, I still have leftover electrons, or I still need to make more bonds. Just make extra bonds to the phosphorus and make everybody else work. So when we're looking at this, 
copy, come back over here, control A, control B, oops, control A, delete, control B. Is this oxygen happy? No. Yes. Yes. Two, four, six, eight. Super happy. What about this oxygen? Um, uh, yes. Yes. And this one? No. Yes. Yes. And this one? Yes. yes. So what about the hydrogens? Yes. Two, two, and two. Yeah. No. Yes. two, two, and two. So who's who's not technically happy? Phosphorus. And phosphorus is like, meh. Don't care. <laughs> <laughs> nah. I'm fine with that. This is okay, I guess. Everybody else needs to be where they are, and you can't have any exceptions to those other ones. So what I'm telling you is the phosphorus and the oxygen, you're like, all right, that's totally fine. I'll I'll, I'll take it. I'll, I'll carry the extra. So, <laughs> so phosphorus has like a scale of how many electrons it can have? A On a... Like, like it can be, it doesn't have to be one set number, like the oxygen has to have it eight. It wants to be eight, but it will accept 10 or 12 electrons. Okay. Hmm. 10 to 12, and that's it after 12. It's... It can probably take more. I just don't know any of those molecules off the top of my head. Okay. Okay, so wow, it's like four. No, I think I'm going to call it a day. I'm going to move on to, we'll talk about formal charges next class. Oh, God, formal charges.